appropriate for the format of our meeting. Please don't ask for your microphone to, to be turned on. And now I would like to uh, introduce uh, our guest. It's my privilege to present our lecturer, uh, Professor Massimiliano, Vis Massimiliano Visocci. Uh, professor was born in uh, Rome, uh, uh, February uh, 1958. He is professor in neurosurgery at the Catholic University of Rome, Italy, uh, and uh, visiting professor at the Shanghai University in China, the George University of London, United Kingdom, at, and the Mumbai University in India uh, since uh, 2012, winner of the national competition for associate professorship in neurosurgery in uh, 2012, uh, and full professorship in 2018, uh, director of the special course and the second degree level master in surgery of craniovertebral junction at the Catholic University of Rome, Italy, since uh, 2013, uh, founder of the research center in surgery of craniovertebral junction, Catholic University of Roma, Italy, uh, chairman of the operative unit of craniovertebral junction surgery, ex co chairman. Neuro Rehabilitation and Reconstruction Committee of the World Federa Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, board member of WFNS Trauma Committee, board member of WFNS Educational Committee, EANS Individual Member Committee Delegate, uh, Vice Chairman EANS International Re Relation Committee, EANS School Base Committee Board Member, Honorary Secretary of the Cranial Vertebral Junction and Spine Society, Executive Board of the World Federation of Cranial Nerve Disorders, Export Member of Italian Society of Neurosurgery, uh, President uh, Alex International Society of Reconstructive Neurosurgery, Former President of uh, Two National Scientific Society, Past Secretary of the Spine Section. Uh, in uh, SANC, uh, member of uh, 13 international and uh, nine national scientific societies, chairman, board organizing scientific committee member, and invited speaker, speaker in more than uh, 350 uh, international and national courses and congress, author of uh, more than uh, 400 papers uh, around uh, two. Uh, 200 peer reviewed, uh, author of uh, six monographic books uh, and editor of four monographic issues. Uh, Iki Akta uh, of the Italian Health, uh, two Akta of indexed peer reviewed journals, member of continued educational committee of the Italian Health uh, Ministry, member of the editorial board of uh, eight international peer reviewed index journal uh, and uh, two national referee of uh, 32 international indexed peer review with journals and four national winner of the INSE award uh, in 1996 uh, on neuromodulation of cerebral blood flow and uh, of the Shanghai University award in uh, two, 2012 on cranial vertebral junction surgery. His interest in general neurosurgery, cranial vertebral junction, junction complex spine uh, neurosurgery, neurotraumatology, and function, functional neurosurgery. Uh, welcome again, Professor. Now you can state, uh, start your uh, share screen. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your beautiful presentation. And uh, also long presentation, and I'm sorry for bothering you, but uh, it's a real pleasure and a real honor to share my experience with you and to present uh, uh, the data of our school concerning cranial vertebral junction uh, uh, cadaveric study, as well as a clinical approach. And um, as you know, 
uh, craniovertebral junction is an ideal region uh, spanning from uh, the um, uh, middle third of the clivus to the upper edge of a C2 body and from the posterior edge of uh, occipital foramen to the spinous process of uh, C2. As you can see also in these uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, slides, uh, uh, on the bottom, uh, many uh, venous and arterial uh, networks, uh, structures uh, surround the bulbobedullary junction, making it very vulnerable to surgery and also viable and strategic uh, uh, functional and uh, um, hemodynamic area uh, in, uh, in uh, the full uh, body. Uh, very schematically, uh, you can uh, find um, very interesting uh, um, uh, ligament network uh, um, uh, surrounding the odontoid, like the alar and apical ligament, the cruciate ligament with the transverse, transverse one uh, strategic and mandatory in order to guarantee uh, stability and the tectorial membrane and the bulbo medullary junction are um, overlying uh, this uh, deep uh, um, ligament uh, uh, network. Also, uh, muscular, uh, muscle and um, vascular arrangement surround uh, in a complex manner the bulbo medullary junction, the craniovertebral junction, and uh, uh, about uh, the uh, bone uh, structure, we have to remember that uh, the strategic embryological uh, um, brick of uh, this uh, area is the proatlas, which is a primordial vertebra, which uh, uh, is involved in uh, the uh, subsequent development of uh, the skull base, the uh, occipital condyles, the odontoid tip and the anterior and posterior uh, components of uh, <coughs> the atlas arch. From a <coughs> functional point of view, half of all the cervical axial rotation occurs at C1, C2. So granulatory junction is strategic in uh, um, promoting and allowing uh, um, axial rotation uh, capability. Uh, and uh, uh, after a disease on surgery at this region, around half of the total uh, axial rotation power decrease and disappear. Surgery indication of a craniovertebral junction uh, area, congenital and segmentation uh, defects like uh, this uh, basilar invagination, uh, in this case, uh, a very um, complex basilar invagination, um, uh, apparently reducible. Anterior epidural abscess, so inflammatory uh, disease, and also rheumatoid deformity with the secondary bas basilar invagination due to inflammatory uh, the generation of the ligaments, as well as uh, calcified synovial cyst, which uh, impinge the bulb <coughs> medullary junction and uh, uh, compress and uh, uh, reduce <coughs> the um, functional uh, attitude of uh, this uh, strategic area. Also, tumors like this cordoma, C2 cordoma, are the target of uh, the craniovertebral junction surgeon, as well as a mm -hmm. post traumatic uh, um, disease like these uh, C2 fracture hypertrophic non union disease, and also a trivial assault like uh, foreign bodies due to a shutting uh, and uh, uh, subsequent uh, bullet removal uh, visible in the right part of the panel. We try to 
to collect uh, all our experience uh, on uh, craniovertebral junction surgery in uh, this uh, special issue of, our, our, of uh, ACTA Neurochirurgica. And we tried also to schematize uh, in this uh, histogram all the surgical opportunity available uh, for uh, uh, engaging uh, the bulbomedullary junction, transolal, transnasal, anterolateral, posterolateral, suboccipital, posterior. These are all the options available in uh, the modern uh, neurosurgical armamentarium. You can see in the blue line, the posterior midline approach, and uh, in the red uh, mm, arrow, the posterolateral or far lateral approach in the yellow, the anterolateral approach, and these are all the extra mucosal, extra mucosal um, posterior and lateral approach. Um, you can see uh, here the posterior midline approach, very simple, very um, confident for uh, neurosurgical use, uh, very frequently used for many other uh, indication, uh, but uh, uh, craniovertebral junction and uh, craniovertebral junction. Um, in, in the neurosurgeon has a great confidence with this approach. And uh, on the other hand, the stability is maintained with the midline posterior approach. Uh, nevertheless, tumors create working space needed and um, so larger tumor are uh, very easy to be removed with the posterior midline approach. On the other hand, uh, let's uh, have a look of uh, posterolateral and anterolateral approach. Uh, when we speak about the posterolateral approach, we speak about uh, uh, the way necessary to remove meningiomas, uh, lower cranial nerves, uh, schwannomas, uh, pica, and vertebral artery aneurysm. And uh, this uh, approach has uh, the advantage to allow a, a great uh, extradural vertebral artery control. And uh, it is mainly conceived for intradural anterolateral access. Uh, this is the operating theater for and the um, surgical positioning for the posterolateral approach. Posterolateral or far lateral are the same thing. Three quarter prone, uh, modified Parker bench, and semi sitting position are the um, positions used uh, for uh, uh, approaching uh, with the uh, posterolateral or far lateral approach. Inverted OK stick and linear retromastoid uh, incision are required to control all the four layers uh, in uh, the far lateral or posterior lateral approach. This is the first layer. You can see here this planum capitis, the sternocleidomastoid artery, and the great occipital nerve. Second. Uh, um, layers uh, allow to uh, identify superior uh, nuchal line, semispinalis capitis, uh, and splenium capitis. Third layers allow to identify semispinalis splenium capitis and lomboid, lomboid suture. Fourth and last um, layer allow to identify the well known. Uh, suboccipital triangle. Suboccipital triangle is uh, uh, confining with the superior oblique muscle, inferior oblique muscle, and the rectus capitis uh, um, uh, muscle uh, uh, in order to um, surrounding in a triangular shape the vertebral artery. Um, another important uh, structure of this uh, approach is uh, the condyle. And um, you can see here vertebral artery surrounding the condyle in a vision from the um, bottom. The uh, advantages of this uh, approach are uh, the simultaneous control of vertebral artery and internal um, I'm sorry, uh, yes, uh, this is uh, 
uh, the uh, a new uh, approach, the anterolateral approach, different from uh, the um, former one. Anterolateral approach is a supine position and it uh, allows to control uh, simultaneously carotid artery and vertebral artery. And uh, it is mainly for extra dural lesion. Uh, con on the contrary, the former approach, posterolateral or farlateral approach, allows uh, mainly transdural control of a bulbomedullary junction. In this uh, different approach, anterolateral or extreme lateral approach, we generally perform an extradural approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can uh, also um, schematize uh, the uh, skin incision with this uh, reversed uh, um, okay stick uh, um, incision uh, on the asp anterior aspect of a sternocleidomastoid muscle. As soon as we um, open uh, the muscle and dissect it from uh, the bone insertion, we can uh, realize uh, here the mastoid uh, process, it's sternocleidomastoid uh, muscle and uh, the um, um, other uh, splen splenius capitis uh, muscle. This is the transverse process of C1. You can see here under uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the accessory uh, nerve and uh, here the occipital artery. And again, we can see uh, another uh, uh, nerve, great auricular superficial nerve compared to the more deeper uh, 11 nerve in front uh, of uh, the 11, there is uh, the jugular uh, vein. And this is another uh, um, um, very schematic uh, representation of uh, inferior oblique muscle, superior oblique muscle, uh, the rectus medialis uh, muscle with the, the uh, occipital artery, and uh, here the vertebral artery, the transverse process, and again vertebral artery. This is the uh, C1 uh, um, groove of uh, vertebral artery. Uh, when we remove the posterior arc of C1, the, posterior, the transverse process of C1, we can shift down the arterial uh, artery and uh, so allow a better uh, engagement uh, of uh, the uh, bulbo medullary junction. Sometimes it is possible to combine anterolateral, so called extreme lateral, and posterolateral, so called far lateral approach in one unique approach allowing to control very huge uh, tumors spanning from the anterior to the posterior aspect of the uh, upper cervical spine. Uh, this is the operating room with the inferior aspect of the mandibular uh, with uh, the uh, mastoid uh, profile, and this is uh, the skin incision line up to the tip of mastoid process before uh, um, uh, um, opening uh, in uh, anterolateral way, the craniovertebral junction, I like to perform um, echography in order to detect where uh, the lesion is, uh, compared to the uh, uh, full extension of uh, the skin uh, incision. And uh, this is uh, the post-operative uh, uh, anterolateral or extreme lateral approach. Uh, when we uh, deal with the anterior approach, we have uh, uh, to change uh, uh, surgical route. Up to now, we have spoken about posterior approach and lateral approach, posterior lateral and anterolateral. Starting from now, we start to speak about the anterior approach. Anterior approach can be extramucosal, like retropharyngeal, or transmucosal, like transoral, transnasal. Let's start with the 
extramucosal anterior approach, so-called submandibular MECFE approach to the cranial vertebral junction. You see very simple drawing indicating that uh, the main target uh, is the tendon between the anterior and posterior uh, digastric uh, belly. Under uh, the tendon, there is the uh, hypoglossal nerve. We have to dissect and to shift uh, um, in, 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 in the upper portion, uh, the nerve in order to um, expose the anterior profile of uh, the uh, craniovertebral junction. Uh, we can identify here the uh, vertebral artery, here fascial artery and vein, hypoglossal nerve. Here there is uh, the uh, superior laryngeal nerve, not visible, and uh, laterally we can uh, identify the, the myeloid muscle and uh, the um, uh, glossopharyngeal muscle. This is the surgical mm -hmm. injection, approximately two finger below the mandibular. And uh, again, we can identify a trapezoid with the, all the structures we have uh, um, mm -hmm. identified before. Um, you can see at the first step, uh, the uh, submandibular gland that we can shift uh, up in order to identify the posterior and the anterior belly of the digastric muscle, just under the tendon, the uh, hypoglossal nerve. This is uh, the um, uh, hypoglossal artery coming from the uh, external carotid artery and um, the surgical domain of the submandibular approach is very impressive in yellow compared to the <clears throat> transnasal, transoral <coughs> and Volisky transcervical endoscopic approach. This is a huge approach, but also anterior approach, which can be performed by using endoscopy and allow to identify also in endoscopic or endoscopic way all the structure we have uh, um, identified before and mainly by removing the, um, uh, the clivus bone we can get in the bulbomedullary junction with a submandibular uh, approach. Uh, this is our uh, paper concerning the possibility to perform in cadaver lab the C1, C2 anterior instrumentation infusion technique just by submandibular approach. In order to show you how huge is the surgical domain of uh, submandibular approach, I want to show you this video coming from our cadaver lab. You see here the digalli, the, 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 um, uh, the gastric uh, belly, anterior, posterior, and the nerve under the tendon. And uh, you see here the superior laryngeal nerve. So huge approach. This is the uh, operating theater. The patient is uh, with the, um, the head extended and turned 45 degree contralateral side. Uh, we love to perform this surgery uh, with the help of O-arm neuronavigation. And this is uh, a great uh, uh, in, uh, bone tumor, uh, exophytic bone tumor uh, coming from uh, the um, C1 uh, lateral mass and uh, spanning over the anterior retropharyngeal area, which was uh, totally removed. But now we move uh, to the uh, transmucosal approach, anterior transmucosal approach, then uh, again comes from uh, the experience of uh, uh, cadaver lab also. And we can see also many uh, Italian um, uh, neurosurgeon engaging this uh, apparently the new at that time approach through the, net, the nose to face with uh, the anterior part of the cranial vertebral junction. 
And uh, as uh, you well know, Kassam in 2005 was the first to claim that uh, the transnasal endoscopic approach was uh, suitable uh, to uh, remove uh, tumors and to remove uh, expanding uh, um, local uh, growing process. But uh, some complications were also noted, like uh, velopalatine insufficiency, sinusitis, nasal cruising. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a very narrow um, uh, approach to the craniovertebral junction. And uh, um, although it uh, allows minimum invasive, invasiveness, uh, it has some limitation for the lower part of uh, the craniovertebral junction. This uh, um, uh, drawing, uh, um, reconstructing CAT scan, um, um, shows how is possible with transnasal approach to control in a fair manner in the green dotted uh, points uh, um, all the clivus and the anterior uh, uh, arc of C1 and uh, the odontoid, but the base of uh, the odontoid. Moreover, when we uh, are in the operating theater, we uh, immediately uh, are become aware, recognize the difficulty to uh, spread uh, up uh, the soft tissue. And so from the theoretical yellow line, the so-called CASAM, nasopalatine line, which allows us to predict the inferior aspect uh, of craniovertebral junction to be controlled and engaged by transnasal approach. As a matter of fact, in the real life and in the surgical theater, this is not reliable, but the reliable lines are the three more lines that we are uh, uh, visible. And uh, they uh, take into account the difficulty to spread up uh, the soft tissue. This is a very impressive uh, basal invagination associated with the platy basia, uh, 180 degree uh, angle between the anterior cranial fossa and the clivus. And uh, uh, the so called uh, um, uh, grade A, according to Goel, uh, basal invagination. We can uh, uh, deal with uh, this uh, compression only by transnasal, you can see here. Not possible to deal with uh, this compression in a, a satisfying way by transoral because of the fact that uh, the lesion is uh, above the hard palate here. So only transnasal approach for this kind of basal invagination type A Type B, basal invagination, reducible basal invagination is uh, um, approachable by transoral approach, just in case after an attempt to, reduct, to uh, get a reduction, these um, invagination do not uh, uh, realign. So in conclusion, a transnasal approach is optimal for controlling clivus and quite narrow for the lower part of, uh, um, of uh, uh, the craniovertebral junction surgery. Now I have uh, some difficulty to proceed with uh, my presentation because uh, the slides doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't go. I have to wait some second and just in case, oh, okay, perfect. And now uh, I want to show you a transnasal approach for a tumor. You see here a huge uh, chordoma in uh, 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 MRI reconstruction, neural navigation. You see here, we are uh, trying to remove uh, by transnasal approach this use cordoma, but at this point, uh, we realize that the carotid artery is, uh, is free and uh, completely exposed to our uh, manoles. Then we remove uh, the endoscope from the nose and put it 
on the uh, mouth, and you can see here the uh, soft palate, the uvula, and the uh, tongue, which is uh, spreaded. And finally, this uh, um, final um, uh, image show that the tumor is uh, under the soft palate and uh, from the nose to the mouth is possible to combine the transnasal transoral for uh, these uh, monsters tumors. Uh, transoral approach is a uh, more ancient and historical gold standard uh, surgical strategy for cardiovascular junction uh, surgical removal of uh, neurosurgical disease. It was uh, Alan Crocker who renew the interest of for uh, this uh, approach uh, already known and used by otologists for uh, uh, special uh, indication in uh, uh, otology uh, but uh, with uh, the use in neurosurgery uh, the neurosurgeon learned uh, so fast that uh, this uh, approach is a, a huge approach compared to the trans or transnasal one uh, with some advantage and adv disadvantage. The disadvantage are also the vasopalatile uh, insufficiency, the um, tongue and glottic swelling, the need uh, some time of uh, tracheostomy. The um, uh, uh, advantages are uh, identified with the uh, green uh, dot lines showing that with transoral you can control almost all the craniovertebral junction. When we define craniovertebral junction, we say that uh, it starts from uh, the um, confine between uh, the middle and the inferior. Uh, um, um, clivus bone up to the base uh, of uh, the C2 body. Uh, so uh, transoral uh, raised up our attention since uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 the beginning of 2000 uh, for the opportunity to use uh, endoscopy uh, as well as uh, microsurgery and for the um, opportunity to deal with uh, um, the help of a neural navigation, uh, um, intraoperative CAT scan, uh, neural monitoring with uh, monster tumors like the one of this uh, unlucky 26 years old woman having this uh, uh, huge, huge retropharyngeal cordoma impinging the bulb medullary junction and spreading up to the lateral part of the craniovertebral junction, eroding the base of uh, uh, the skull base uh, and also um, the uh, lateral mass of C1 and the odontoid and the body of C2. So at that time we were used to uh, divide in two times, uh, in two steps, the uh, uh, removal and the instrumentation infusion of the patient, uh, which after surgery be became uh, unstable. And uh, the first part of uh, the surgery uh, included uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, reduction of anterior arc of C1, you see here, this is the tongue on the upper part, the uh, lateral part of the uh, pharynx is spreaded by the Crocker distractor. This is C1 anterior arc removed, and with the CUSA, we are uh, eroding and decompressing the um, odontoid up to realize uh, the transverse ligament, uh, which is uh, uh, very evident here. You see the transverse ligament. Um, completely peeled from the tumor and uh, under the transverse ligament you can realize the tumor again uh, spanning uh, and identified by the neural navigation spanning up to the lateral uh, soft tissue uh, aspect of the oropharynx and uh, again uh, you can see the uh, you know the um, 
removal of the tumor under the soft palate and the closure in a three layers manner, mandatory in order to avoid uh, the um, uh, CSF uh, leakage, which could be uh, fatal in some circumstances before, close, before uh, um, uh, finishing the surgery, we have to introduce an autopalatine tube in order to allow the patient to be feeded for one week and to avoid uh, uh, traumatism on the um, uh, wound. And this is the post-operative control and the CAT scan post-operative control of uh, uh, the patient. So uh, now we wait again some few seconds in order to avoid this very heavy presentation to uh, progress to the next uh, uh, slide. Few seconds, please. Any questions to fill the whole of this? Uh, uh, Professor, we, we forward the questions to you after the presentation. Yes, okay. And uh, the presentation doesn't proceed anymore. I don't know why. Uh, we have no time limitation. We can't wait. Uh, we don't problem it. Professor. Okay. Ju just wait for a few seconds. In, I, I, I stop to speak in order to wait the uh, popping up of the next uh, slide. Just a few seconds of pa your patient. Okay, okay, no problem, Professor. Okay. Very good. This is uh, another case uh, for a mistake. We called it C1, C2 cystic chondroma. As a matter of fact, uh, this is uh, a synovial cyst. So please uh, forgive me for this uh, mistake. This is a synovial cyst of a 68 years old gentleman. Uh, compressing bulbo medullary uh, junction. You can see how uh, as soon as we open on, in the midline, the rife of the um, pharynx, you uh, realize immediately the um, anterior arc of C1 and after removing it, the odontoid profile very clearly identified with the sonopet, the special CUSA used for, for bone removal. And uh, you can see here how anatomically is uh, this image. This is the transverse ligament that, uh, I'm sorry, this is the odontoid we are removing with the, the drill and uh, the CUSA. And this is the transverse ligament that we are uh, removing uh, with uh, the rongeur. And uh, at that time, we uh, um, shift from the microscope to the endoscope and get in in the uh, area we have the compressor and identify and catch the, uh, odonto the, the synovial cyst, uh, which is a shift like, uh, um, you know, a grapefruit, uh, um, uh, um, element and uh, we put uh, in the uh, surgical area, we inject uh, the um, uh, contrast medium in order to evaluate indirectly how much have uh, again to proceed to complete our removal. And we again shift to the microscope and complete to remove uh, the inf inferior part of the uh, 
clay was bone. Before closing, we put some sponge and uh, some glue uh, over the sponge and uh, close uh, in three layers uh, as we have uh, done uh, in, uh, in the other case. And um, uh, if you can see uh, post-operative uh, MRI examination, doesn't show anymore the um, synovial cyst and the bulbo medullary junction seems uh, uh, satisfactory decompressed. Uh, this is another very complex uh, non union uh, post traumatic uh, uh, craniovertebral junction deformity, which uh, uh, came to our observation uh, with. Uh, um, uh, helicopter in emergency, and uh, you can see there is a, a rotational C1, C2 um, instability and uh, um, deformity with the compression of a bulbo medullary uh, junction. And again, uh, I have a, a problem with the, the computer echo. And now you can see the MRI with the impingement of the bulbo medullary junction before and after, uh, before and after uh, surgery. Um, and uh, it seems uh, quite satisfactory. Um, Okay, uh, sorry, but this is a very heavy presentation and so many, many slides, uh, many pixels. And so that's why there are, there are some, uh, some uh, stopping moment. Uh, this is the post-op uh, CAT scan of the decompression with the, the uh, instrumentation infusion as well. And uh, this is the final control of uh, uh, the decompression. This is the third anterior approach available, um, the fourth uh, anterior approach available for craniovertebral junction. And this is uh, an extra mucosal approach, the so called Volinsky approach, that is, uh, um, that comes from uh, the experience for uh, C2 infibulation. And uh, um, this uh, is uh, due um, uh, to the experience of a neurotraumatological uh, spine surgeons that uh, try to investigate uh, the use of the endoscope in the, um, in, the, um, uh, in the same way used for uh, screwing C2 Anderson uh, to fractures. But as a matter of fact, as you can see, in this uh, picture um, withdrawn from uh, a paper we have written on uh, war neurosurgery, <clears throat> this approach allowed to engage only the odontoid, the green dots, but not the anterior arc of C1 and all the climbs. So it is uh, unusable for a wide control of a craniovertebral junction. I do not recommend this approach. Now try to uh, let's try to compare transnasal and transoral. And the group of uh, Edward Benzel came in our help because uh, uh, compared 26 uh, uh, articles dealing with the transoral and transnasal surgical approach and what they um, concluded and found out is uh, that uh, if we consider transoral is, is a gray and uh, uh, transnasal as a black, uh, transnasal is worse compared to transoral for uh, the risk of uh, CSF leak, of uh, medical complication, of uh, meningitis, of uh, the need of a reoperation, of uh, velopalatine insufficiency, but Transoral is worse compared to transnasal for the need of a tracheostomy because uh, around 80% of uh, transoral uh, operated patients need tracheostomy. And uh, that's why 
um, transnasal was conceived. But on the other hand, transnasal has many other advantages we have uh, seen uh, together. Meat and truth, uh, endoscopic and nasal approach compared to transoral approach, which is better? This is uh, one of uh, transnasal uh, uh, surgeries we have performed in our, in our institution. This is uh, a basal invagination, which was proved to be irreducible with dynamic X-ray examination. And uh, uh, you can see here X-ray examination, dynamic X-ray didn't uh, show any movement. So we decided to decompress from the anterior approach, from transmucosal approach, from transnasal approach, since uh, the basal invagination seems suitable for this, and the compression was uh, over um, the hard palate. We decompressed uh, as demonstrated by MRI examination and also confirmed by um, CAT scan bone examination, but soon after uh, uh, surgical approach, we asked for MRI examination post-op which show in few days after surgery, this hyperintensity in the posterior cranial fossa. And uh, also in the cerebellum hemisphere, some days more. And again, in uh, uh, frontal lobe, what happened? It happened that uh, the patient had, uh, unfortunately, a, um, uh, CSF uh, uh, leakage during operation. You see the CSF here. There is a leakage uh, just uh, in the correspondence of uh, uh, the C1, C2 um, junction. And uh, as, uh, in, uh, uh, as we are used to do in this case, uh, we try to repair this uh, um, CSF leakage by using a, a flap, a mucosal flap, and by putting a fibrin glue over and uh, also a uh, sponge and uh, hydroxy um, cellulose and uh, um, also swelling a catheter, a, a catheter uh, to um, uh, allow the um, uh, flap to um, go uh, close uh, to the uh, fistula, but it was not sufficient, it was not enough. And the CSF fistula start again. And although the patient was uh, um, uh, walkie talkie, so uh, was uh, walking uh, two days after surgery, and uh, was uh, used to get the breakfast by himself alone. In uh, 20 days, the infection developed and uh, to, in a, a um, sadly manner produced an encephalitis, uh, which uh, drove the patient to the death. So pay attention to transnasal approach. We didn't have any infection for transoral, but in a few transnasal we had. This is very curious uh, uh, case of a patient, pediatric patient, uh, which who um, had a, a basal invagination associated with uh, a Chiari malformation and uh, um, uh, also, this embryologic uh, malformation with the bifidism of a posterior C1 arc. You see here a, a, a huge impingement of the bulb medullary junction. You see, after surgery, how high we were able to go by using transoral approach. We uh, reached the synchondrosis be between the uh, sphenoid bone and the uh, superior third of a clivus bone. And very surprisingly, we obtained a huge decompression as uh, demonstrated by this post-op uh, MRI uh, examination. But a few months later on, odontoid start to regrowth as well as the Clivus start to regrowth and in one year, completely reconstruction 
uh, of uh, uh, clivus and odontoid produce a relapse of uh, bulb medullary junction compression and a recurrence of uh, Chiari malformation that uh, required a second operation. Very, very strange and unusual case. This is another curious case uh, of uh, non-union, non-union, post-traumatic non-union of type two Anderson uh, uh, fracture, uh, which we uh, um, try to correct with transoral decompression and fusion. But if you look at the tongue, you see an hypertrophic tongue, which justify the fact that uh, we were not able to remove totally the body of a C2. So this is before surgery. This is after surgery, a remnant of the C2 body remain and um, gave us uh, the impression that uh, the um, uh, uh, results was uh, completely unsatisfying. But 10 months later, you can see how the craniovertebral junction readapt and uh, how the decompression uh, uh, reduce. Probably in this case, we should need, have need uh, a um, different approach like uh, the um, uh, transoral extended uh, transglottic uh, approach uh, uh, or uh, the mandibular swing extended transoral approach which has uh, some advantages, but also many advantages, like the fact that uh, we have to cut the tuba, and so the patient become deaf, and uh, like the fact that we have to isolate and injure the ninth and the um, hypoglossal, the, uh, the twelfth, so the patient can uh, collect and uh, have some uh, uh, cranial nerve dysfunction after surgery. So we conclude with uh, our um, experimental uh, works on uh, comparison between transoral and transnasal, which is the better, which is the best, transoral or transnasal? Can we ask this kind of uh, question, which is better of, of uh, among uh, transnasal and transoral? We try to answer this uh, question by using our cadaver lab with the neural navigation and um, the uh, possibility to use a fresh cadaver in a, a medical legal department. And uh, in uh, this uh, cadaver, we try to um, put our uh, probes through the nose and uh, uh, tongue uh, after spreading uh, uh, with the crocard uh, spreader and uh, to compare uh, what we can gain from uh, a surgical point of view by using the nostrils or uh, the, um, the, the transoral approach. And uh, you can see here in the lateral approach, transnasal, transoral, transnasal, transoral. The um, surgical domain of transnasal, uh, 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 transnostril probes compared to the transoral probes clearly show how huge is both in a lateral and antero posterior antero posterior transnasal transoral approach the surgical domain this is transoral cat scan 3d reconstruction domain this is transnasal transoral transnasal and uh, also, we try to uh, reconstruct an ideal uh, pre-operative uh, line predicting uh, the uh, superior surgical domain of transoral, like the Kassam line uh, of uh, transoral, and um, also try to identify all these uh, uh, topics, uh, both uh, in uh, a fresh cadaver, and in a perfuse embalmed uh, isolated head. And uh, with the help of uh, neural navigation, again, <clears throat> we try to compare in yellow transnasal 
and transoral in sagittal plane and transnasal, transoral and transnasal in coronal plane. And again, from a volumetric point of view, transoral and transnasal uh, seems to confirm that uh, uh, transoral is a much more huge uh, surgical approach compared to transnasal. And so we also publish in uh, our uh, experience. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, uh, beside some provocative uh, titles like uh, historical perspective uh, or never say never, we try also to uh, try to find a, a diplomatic way to behave with the surgical armamentarium. Maybe combined approach like transnasal, transoral can be the solution for a huge anterior midline approach has combined anterolateral and posterolateral approach the so-called extreme lateral and parlateral approach can be suitable, should be suitable for a huge lateral uh, spreading lesion. So I conclude my uh, presentation. I want to really thank you for your patience, for having invited me, for uh, having allowed me to present uh, our experience uh, and uh, to have uh, uh, um, uh, raised the attention of uh, many people uh, on uh, these uh, challenging uh, surgical and uh, anatomic uh, um, uh, topic. As uh, uh, chairman of uh, the um, master second degree of craniovertebral junction surgical approach, I invite you to join us uh, for the next edition at the end of this year of uh, this uh, theoretical and practical master. And uh, I hope to meet you in person. And uh, I really thank you so much for uh, your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, it was uh, excellent lectures. Uh, now uh, we uh, move to uh, questions. Firstly, I want to ask one question. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Professor. Okay, it's good. Go on. You you didn't speak uh, much more about basilar invagination uh, in your uh, presentation, but we know uh, you are familiar and most experienced uh, person uh, about this topic in the world. Uh, I want to ask uh, one question uh, about basilar invagination uh, in. Uh, uh, reducible or irreducible case. Uh, I think in irreducible case, you prefer to uh, anterior uh, approach only. Uh, but uh, in our practice, we uh, use uh, only posterior fixation and fusion. Uh, in uh, irreducible and reducible case, we don't uh, see much more uh, radiological, radiological uh, regression. Uh, but we uh, uh, see uh, clinical improvement in patients. What do you uh, think about this uh, steps? Very good question. Thank you so much for uh, raising the attention to, to um, uh, other option uh, of uh, surgical treatment. As you uh, well know, uh, basial invagination can be reducible and irreducible. Just in case uh, it is uh, irreducible, we have to decompress. And since it is an anterior compression of craniovertebral junction, we have to decompress it from anterior aspect by removing by transnasal or transoral or submandibular extramucosal approach. In case the basal invagination is reducible, that means that we have to realign something that uh, it is not uh, in a good shape due to a disease, due to a rheumatoid arthritis, due to a trauma, due to a fracture, due to inflammatory uh, disease like grisel 
disease and etc. And uh, in this way, uh, Professor Atul Goel uh, illuminated, showed us the way to behave because uh, he first conceived the need both to fix with uh, uh, screws uh, in uh, uh, C0, C occipital condyle and uh, um, C1 lateral mass, but also uh, with the enhancement of uh, putting a, a spreader, a spreader, a vertical spreader, a graft between the C1 and C2 articulation. When we uh, put a spreader uh, one centimeter length between C1 and C2 articulation, we rise up C1 and pull down C2 and produce a functional, functional decompression of basilar invagination, which is possible without any removal, only by realigning and fixating in distraction C1, C2. So my experience is good results for uh, the compression by transnasal transoral route for irreducible basilar invagination, as well as uh, excellent results with uh, uh, instrumentation, infusion, and distraction with the uh, uh, interarticular spreader in reducible basilar invagination. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, and uh, another question. Uh, what do you think about the uh, axial uh, instability? In the other uh, part of the spine, uh, we uh, think uh, if there is no uh, uh, clue about uh, instability with uh, uh, the dynamic wind, but we uh, sometimes prefer stabilization for these uh, issues. Uh, what do you think about for cranial vertebral junction and uh, axial instability? Can we use same approach to the uh, cranial vertebral junction? Uh, but you 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 said uh, in a very right way. Um, what should should be the name of basilar invagination? Because basilar invagination is an axial instability. As a matter of fact, or according to Atul Goel language, is a transatlantic, transatlantic instability, in the sense that the odontoid get in the um, uh, um, uh, atlantal bone, and so in a vertical way we face with a instability of C1, C2. So we can account for instability of C1, C2 in the vertical plane, like basilar invagination, in the anteroposterior or sagittal plane, like in so classic C1, C2 instability in our common experience. And sometimes, we can also identify a coronal C1, C2 instability. When we ask the patient to perform lateral bending, you can find in some cases an abnormal redundant um, uh, movement, mobility of the odontoid compared to the um, uh, lateral mass of C1 and also these uh, a feature it can be associated with the clinical symptomatology. So sometimes we have not any instability in the sagittal plane, but we can have instability in the coronal plate, plane or also in uh, the vertical plane. In uh, this uh, uh, special uh, occasion, we also can uh, drive to an instrumentation infusion procedure as uh, the cure of uh, the disease. C1, C2 instability is a very complex uh, issue. And according to Atul Goel, it's difficult to, to be able to declare that we, all, we, we know everything. Everything is clear for us and we can find uh, 
any solution for any disease because uh, it is uh, a matter under study and under investigation and we need to investigate further and further in, in the future. Only. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there is another question uh, from Professor Bektaş Açıkgöz. Uh, he says, thank you very much, Professor Visochi, for your impressive presentation. Congratulations. Uh, is there a role of free uh, fat grafts or sponges in the management of CSF disorder? Uh, pardon me, say again, I have uh, lost the uh, audio. Okay, okay. Uh, another question from uh, Professor Bektaş Açıkgöz. Uh, he says, uh, thank you very much, Professor, for thank your you. imperative presentation. Congratulations. Uh, is there a role for free fat grafts or sponges in the management of CSF fistulas? Yes, uh, if I well understood, because I have some uh, problems with audio, we, uh, he, he asked about uh, CSF fistula, CFA, CSF leakage, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. The role uh, of free fat grafts and sponges. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, in uh, transnasal uh, pituitary uh, surgery uh, for huge uh, a pituitary lesion, there is the rule of the 3F, according to uh, Capabianca and Cavallo. 3F means uh, fast, fat, flap. Fast, number one, to make uh, possible the patient to wake up, to, to stand up very fast in the immediate post-op time, to be fast also in uh, the um, fistula repair, fat, to take some uh, withdrawal of uh, fat and put over the um, fistula plane, uh, over the dura, and flap. Flap, uh, two, two different type of flaps, the pedicle, flap and the free flap. In the, at the very beginning of our uh, surgical activity, we were uh, uh, preferring uh, the free flap. That means that we cut a, you know, a, a layer of uh, isolated uh, mucosa and uh, put uh, like a, a dura substitute over the, mm, the fistula. But uh, uh, subsequently, with the help of the uh, otologist, we moved to um, the pedicle the flap. So we isolate the uh, pedicle flap with uh, the mm, a, a, a feeding artery uh, still viable. And uh, we uh, uh, move it uh, uh, to the lower part of uh, the nose up to uh, uh, be um, uh, paste over the fistula with the fibrin glue. So the answer to the question is for a huge fistula, fat and uh, flap, pedicle flap. For a small fistula, I don't use uh, um, fat, but I use uh, only uh, the flap, pedicle flap, with uh, the glue and over the glue, the sponge, and uh, uh, over the sponge, a balloon filled of uh, uh, air in, at pressure in order to be sure that the flap um, is tightened to the dura um, fistula uh, for three days. Uh, sometime when uh, Necessary, we can add also um, drainage, CSF drainage from uh, uh, lumbar puncture. And uh, so, uh, you know, many manners to um, manage different entity of a CSF pistola. Uh, thank you, Professor. There is another question from uh, Professor Hasan Kamil Sucu. He says, uh, thank you, Professor Visochi, for your such a detailed uh, presentation. 
You said you can gain uh, one centimeter deflection between C1 lateral mass and uh, C2 superior articular surface by putting grab or cage. It uh, sounds too much for me. We generally put uh, four or five millimeter high cage into the, this space. How can you distract this, uh, this joint by uh, 10 millimeters? Yes, uh, but you know, um, there are um, many ways to um, manage this uh, uh, issue. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, in Italy, there is not an official uh, uh, permission to perform uh, uh, this kind of uh, um, distraction. Uh, it is not recognized and as a gold standard for basal invagination. So uh, when we uh, perform it, uh, we have to get the uh, permission from the patient and uh, from the ethical committee and uh, the um, uh, local um, authorities. There is not uh, a, a, a rule. Uh, it is... Uh, uh, um, uh, it is up to the local anatomy. As a matter of fact, if we have an old patient with arthrosis, with degenerative disease, with the calcified ligaments, the expectation to provide a reduction, a functional reduction of basilar invagination by putting graft in lateral mass and occipital condyle are low because uh, the ligaments are, do not allow to, um, to, the, to the odontoid to, ride, to, to um, slide down. In this case, uh, a low profile cage uh, is uh, um, absolutely um, uh, recommended. Otherwise, in younger, in younger uh, patients with uh, very elastic and uh, uh, very um, and longable articulation, more than five millimeters can uh, can be uh, can be obtained. Uh, I um, I uh, spoke about one centimeter because in cadaver lab, I proved that. Uh, up to one centimeter, you can uh, spread C0, uh, C1, C2 uh, in, base, in, in a supposed uh, basal invagination. In a living patient, I didn't use more than the five millimeters. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Şükrü Çağlar with us, uh, he is the uh, past president of uh, Turkish uh, Neurosurgical Society. Uh, Professor Çağlar, uh, did you want to uh, any comment or contribution? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. This was an amazing lecture. And Thank the you. Foramen Magnum is uh, somehow spine or brain whatever you are dealing with, it's the, I think the main regions that you, the surgery is always challenging. And nowadays, our Italian colleagues make a breakthrough with endoscopy, I think, in this region. And uh, please forgive me, I, I would like to make a, some comments. Kami, Professor Kami, and it was one of the turning points after Crocart. Bernard George was also, I think, an important figure in this region. Yes, nowadays, I think without video assistance or endoscopy, uh, to operate this region is almost uh, very difficult. So you need neuro navigation, but endoscopy as well. If the lesion is intradural, then microscopic neurosurgery training may be much more than sufficient to deal with lesions like what I magnum. I like the way the transcondylar or posterolateral approach, and I do not remove any part of the condyle, and I can manage to remove most of the lesions if they are purely intradural, 
in this region. But if the lesions are on the bone, then we are dealing with the clivus, lower clivus, spine, or C1, C2, then uh, there is another story. Nowadays, uh, the transoral approach is becoming more popular because thanks to the endoscopy. As you may recall, uh, at my age, there are many patients after transoral surgery who suffers for months. They had difficulty in swallowing. They have to uh, break with trachotomies and the velova palatal insufficiency was a real problem. And when we came to the CSF fistula, it was always a, a very, very difficult to manage. Nowadays, maybe somehow spectacular, but uh, the use of the robotic handles that general surgeons use to close the retropharyngeal mucosa and the muscle layer, because it can give you the ability to turn the steer more than 180 degrees. So the first thing can be closed tightly. In transoral surgery, closure is the most important, difficult, and challenging part. Still, it's the most important part. And I think uh, endoscopy doesn't help a lot in closing, but maybe in the future we will see other methods. Technology is becoming more popular. And uh, last comment, uh, we all like surgery of this field. We are, it's a challenging surgery, but I really enjoy it. And then I'm, may, may I make a point? I know the Atul Goyal's bright ideas, I admire him, but in most of the cases, C1 is assimilated to C0. So there is no way to distract. At least one part is assimilated to the occipital bone. So this is a, sometimes a fairy tale. I don't think you should push the, the patient to spread or to distract that part too much. Sometimes you cannot easily understand the anatomy. Camille may be, I think I had tried to remark the same point. C1 sometimes may be assimilated to occipital bone, so do not try to distract that part in that case. And the other part, uh, what do you think, Professor, uh, about the stereotactic radiosurgery, the, all these cyber lines? Are they going to uh, kick the RS? I mean, surgeons uh, are still struggling to keep it. And the final word, if uh, you agree with me, this part of surgery, uh, you have to know all the approaches, all the techniques, and you have to study in every patient individually the pathological anatomy, not the cadaver anatomy. So you have to decide a tailored surgery for each patient, for each lesion. And uh, thank you very much. It was, I really enjoyed your cases. I hope we meet again and we can discuss more and more. There are a lot of cases to discuss. But what about this radio surgery thing? Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and for your question. Your comments are very brilliant. I completely agree with you. I think that uh, Cadaver Lab is uh, like a grammar for a, a language. If you do not know the grammar, you can speak and properly. And uh, so uh, it is uh, uh, in, impossible to accept the idea to go to operating room without having spent a um, training uh, time in the cadaver lab and uh, have seen in the cadaver first what you are approaching in the living uh, being, uh, human being now. And so uh, again, uh, from the past, to the present from the anatomic experience of the past to the anatomic experience of the present, uh, prodromic to surgical application. And uh, 
again, uh, every patient is a model and it is um, <coughs> repeatable. Uh, every patient, every disease uh, is a special disease. We have to tailor surgery, not to the surgical approach that we have decided in our mind before to doing it, but to the patient, to my human being and to the disease <coughs> inside the, the body of the patient. Many diseases, and now I answer to your question, are not uh, uh, um, curable at all by a complete surgery, like cordoma. <coughs> and uh, since uh, cordoma is one of <coughs> the most uh, challenging uh, um, tumors in a craniovertebral junction, for them, <coughs> adrotherapy and proton beam is uh, absolutely mandatory after even an apparently radical removal. Radiosurgery. <coughs> I like radiosurgery. I think that um, every strategy has a dignity for every patient. Uh, if I'm a, <coughs> a, a neurosurgeon, I, my, I, I have the temptation to do everything with uh, my knife and with the neurosurgery. If uh, I am a radio surgeon, my temptation is to try to solve all the problems with the uh, uh, radio surgery, like uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, like uh, vascular malformation, you know. I think that uh, according to my last slide of my presentation, combined approach, diplomacy in uh, therapy, in medicine, as in policy is uh, mandatory. And we are living a very sad time for international policy, as you all know, but uh, the same for uh, uh, neurosurgery, diplomacy and sharing experience. In my personal experience, when I deal with the cordoma, I try to remove uh, it at uh, the best way with the endoscopic, microscopic surgery, with uh, CUSA, with uh, uh, everything I have with neuronavigation, with uh, neuromonitoring. But at the end of, the, uh, of, my, uh, of my intervention, I know that I am only at the first step of this long uh, problem, long disease. And so I address the patient to the radio surgeon. And also the radio surgeon should do uh, before approaching a surgical curable disease when it's possible, just to sending the patient to the neurosurgeon and then to expecting back him for a final and a concluding uh, treatment. This is my idea, I completely agree with you. Uh, I don't like uh, to clean up uh, all the past experience and to believe that uh, all the new is better. Endoscopy has some limits, but by uniting, by uh, uh, tighten the uh, different experience with the microscope, with the open surgery, with the endoscope, with the egg exoscope, you know, exoscope. I tried also to use exoscope for transoral. I published also a paper, but I conclude that uh, if uh, you can do at the best a surgical technique with uh, an old fashioned uh, instrument, you have to use an old fashioned instrument. If you have uh, the sure, if you are sure that the results will be better than with the unknown new tools that uh, still not is uh, fully in uh, our hands. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, and Professor Chalar says, thank you for this amazing le lecture. And uh, Professor uh, Bektaş Açıkgöl say, thank you again for the speech and excellent uh, discussion. 
Baran, you are always uh, welcome to uh, Antalya. Baran, you didn't read the other comment. Other and other. Uh, Professor Chavez, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Kamil Suju and his team. Uh, now, I don't see any other comment or question. Uh, Professor Suju, uh, do, you, do you want to say anything? Professor Bektesh Açıkköz made his move before than me and invite uh, Professor Visochi to Antalya, but uh, Visochi must come to Izmir first, then maybe uh, okay. can go to Antalya. And we will be happy to uh, make uh, a host, be host of him in Izmir. We can show around. Uh, thank you for this wonderful lecture. Professor Visochi, you said you invite us to a meeting, I think, uh, which, what was it? And you, can you please uh, send the link about the meeting? Yes, as a matter of fact, this is not a meeting. This is a master okay. course. Master course, uh, it, uh, its duration is nine months, uh, one lesson a week. Uh, tomorrow we will have a lesson with many speakers. Uh, tomorrow we will have uh, Oscar Alves, uh, who is a, a very expert spinal neurosurgeon of uh, Lisboa in uh, Portugal. Last time uh, I had uh, um, uh, other very high profile uh, speakers like uh, um, Jesus Lafuente, Dimitriades, the president of ENS, um, and uh, also uh, Lucas Razulic, you know. Uh, but uh, this uh, uh, master course has the advantage to provide a, a European uh, well recognized uh, diploma as a specialist of uh, in craniovertebral junction surgery. And um, also, there is a cadaver lab and uh, some uh, uh, surgical uh, uh, opportunities to face with uh, um, transoral, uh, transnasal, and the posterior instrumentation operation. So, if you are interested, I will can I can send you the program of the next course and uh, all the requisite and the uh, links to um, apply for uh, for the course. Okay, thank you uh, so much. If you send me the program to my yes. email, I can yes. share with my I, friends. I can do it. I can do it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Baran, yes. there is last. Uh, there is another thanks from Dr. Nurullah Kösmene. He says thanks a lot for this brilliant lecture, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. So kind. Okay. okay. Uh, I want to thank all of you to join us today this evening and we hope to see you face to face professor Visochi. i hope okay goodbye thanks again thank you bye bye, bye, -bye.